Lesson 11.5, this is all about churches and immigration. What strategies did missionaries and religious communities use to attract immigrants to Western Canada? We're going to learn that and more today. So stick around and let's learn something. missionaries and religious communities this is like i said 11.5 what strategies did those missionaries and religious communities use to attract immigrants to western canada in this point in canada's history we've been learning about how government agents went out to sell i'm using air quotations you can't see it but it's there uh, to sell canada and religious communities and missionaries also helped uh, to bring immigrants into Canada. So this is all about churches and immigration. Churches and various religious groups, obviously they are going to take interest in immigration to build their faiths. Canada West offered a better life for many of our immigrants who were fleeing being persecuted in their homelands because of their religious beliefs and their values. Immigrants were persecuted in those home countries for their religion as well as for their political views. So Canada offered a place for them to follow their faith in peace. We're going to get started in Western Canada with something called the Barr Colony. There was an Anglican minister, Isaac Barr, who was advertising in England, in Britain, to bring British immigrants to Western Canada. He wanted them there, and in 1903, he got a large pocket of land between Alberta and Saskatchewan, present-day Alberta and Saskatchewan, and he led 2,684 people to Canada. But it didn't go so well. So the ship that he arranged to bring these immigrants over only held 900 people, but he put all 2,684 people on board that ship. You can only imagine what the conditions would have been like at that time to make that journey across the Atlantic. Nonetheless, they make it. So they're in St. John and they've, they realize real quick that no railway transport was organized for them to make their way out west. Not only that, most of the immigrants that made their journey over, they lost their luggage. So an individual by the name of George Lloyd gets involved and he arranges for these um, immigrants to make their way to Western Canada by way of ox. And they traveled by ox to Saskatoon with the help of George Lloyd. Now you can only imagine how difficult it would have been to go from St. John all the way across Canada into Saskatchewan, into the center of Saskatchewan, middle of Saskatchewan into Saskatoon. That would have been a very difficult, long, tedious, tiring journey. And that would have made the colonists very upset. So that's exactly what happened. They were very upset. And they forced Minister Isaac Barr to resign as their leader, and they replaced him with George Lloyd. And they named their town after George Lloyd, Lloyd Minister, which is still there today between the Alberta and Saskatchewan borders. Another group that we're going to take a look at are the Hutterites. And the Hutterites are uh, from the Protestant uh, religion. They're a group of Protestants. And um, they believe that they should be living collectively amongst themselves, so other Hutterites are living with Hutterites, in isolation, so separate from the rest of society. All the, uh, all the uh, Hutterites will live um, with themselves. And they were pacifists, which means that they refused to fight as soldiers. And we know that they came over in uh, about 1864. They fled their home country to come to North Dakota down in the United States. But it wasn't that much later that the First World War began and the United States started looking at the Hutterites with suspicion. They were German speakers after all, and they didn't like that. They were, they were very suspicious of the Hutterites and they were worried about them. Many Americans took it upon themselves to take away the cattle and the sheep that belonged to the Hutterites. And that caused the Hutterites to look elsewhere, to go and live someplace else. So many of them ended up moving over to uh, Manitoba or into Alberta. And the Canadian government welcomed them with open arms. 
and they allowed them to avoid military service. They got to teach in their own schools, so they didn't have to send their, their children to publicly funded schools. And today we have about 25,000 living in Alberta, so roughly 60 or so colonies. And we're going to stick with the Hutterites because they had a completely different settlement pattern compared to the rest of Western Canada. Remember what I mentioned earlier, they lived a communal lifestyle. They owned no private property. They shared all the equipment, all the farming equipment that they needed. They shared all their books, they shared their toys, and it was even common to share bank accounts. They looked to their elders to make very important decisions. And we have about 100 to 130 living in each colony. A Bruderhof is the name of their colony. I think that's how you would say it. I'd have to get Siri to check that for me. And in the picture here, you can see that this is not a typical Western Canadian farm because here in the center, we have this village, all of the houses, all of like the town hall, the village hall, the banquet hall, the whatever you want to call it, and the homes, they're all surrounded together in the center with the farmland around the outside. The next group that we're going to talk about are the British home children. And the British home children between 1867 and 1924, it's about 100,000 kids who were living in Britain at the time. These kids were orphans or they came from poor families. And while they were living in Britain, they worked, they begged, they even stole to make ends meet. And there was a hope that they could join Canadian families and that these Canadian families would take them in. So who organized all this? Well, it was religious organizations and charitable organizations that brought these British home children over. And yes, they did work with Canadian farmers, but in return, it wasn't what they were expecting. They were kind of expecting to be adopted by Canadian farmers. Instead, they were, they were hired by Canadians instead. And these children were making a wage, but they had to turn around and pay for their room and board to the Canadian families that took them in. All right, I want you to head over to your notebook and complete the questions for this part of the chapter.